Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday YouTube channel. I am your host, Ryan Hartley. This channel is for heart-centered leaders just like you. I hope our time spent together helps you leave a heart print where those around you are left better than yesterday. These interview sessions are sponsored by our great friends at Elevate Online Marketing. For the month of October, I will be turning back the clocks and sharing some of my favorite episodes from the last four years that inspire a message of faith, hope, and love. On episode 193, we revisit episode 77 with John Gordon. John's episode really epitomizes what it means to have faith, to show up with faith, and, and to lead with faith. I was still very early in my own faith journey and it was just incredible to sit down and, and have this kind of conversation with someone who I had um, been inspired by, who I admired um, before coming to faith. I have been inspired by John's book, The Energy Bus, Training Camp, The Power of Positive Leadership. John has written so many best-selling books. He's inspired audiences and readers all around the world work, working with some of the world's leading companies and sports teams and you can probably sense from from my tone as I speak that I'm just very very grateful to be sat and having this conversation it's still very early in my podcasting journey as well episode 77 and this is during the pandemic so you put all those factors together you know Ryan Hartley had not long left his safety of his full-time job to run always better than yesterday full-time um, he's become a man of faith in this time and he's sitting down on his podcast having a conversation with someone that has massively inspired him up until that point it's uh it's one i've um i've reflected back on with a big smile on my face and i'm really looking forward to having you hear this maybe for the first time maybe you've been a new subscriber to the show in the last year or so so i hope you enjoy the revisit of episode 77 with john gordon and welcome back to the Always Best Than Yesterday interview sessions. And it is my great honor to be having Mr. John Gordon as my special guest today. Welcome, John. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. So I want to kick this off to start with by, first of all, with a big thank you. You've been a huge mentor of mine for a number of years. I've consumed your books and it, they have played a huge part in my own leadership journey and the way I show up and, and help my always better than yesterday community. So first one, honor you for that and say, thank you. That means a lot. Where did you find me being from England? So my wife was a network marketer and she worked for a company called unique and they were massive with the self-development world and they were all listening to the energy bus at the time. So I think 2017, 2016, 2017 is when I first came across the energy bus. Oh, that's great. I always love to hear how people find it. Yeah, it's amazing. So please just give me, uh, I think, I think from what I know, George within the energy bus was a lot based on, on your story. Could you help bring that to life a little bit? Tell us what it was like before you, uh, you stepped into this positivity that you, you talk about. Yeah, 2001, I was really miserable and negative. We had just moved to Jacksonville, Florida from Atlanta. I had a wife, two small children, and I was allowing the pressure and stress of life to really get me down. I was really crumbling under the pressure and the fear. And I was really negative. And my wife had had enough of my negativity. She said, if you don't change, you know, we're over. You have to change. So I agreed to change. I began this journey of working to become a more positive person. I had to be. I wanted to stay married to my wife. Mm -hmm. And in that journey, I started to research ways that I could be more positive and I started to study emer the emerging field of positive psychology at the time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that would lead me to start this newsletter, a weekly positive tip. And every week I would share something I was reading, something I was learning, and people started to follow that. Initially I had five subscribers, my mother, my brother, <laughs> my best friend from college. And then it just started to expand. And that led to, you know, a couple books of writing a few books, but those weren't the energy bus. Those were books that I, I wrote before I came to faith. And then I had a real strong faith experience where it's hard to explain. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not someone who ever thought I would believe what I believe, but mm -hmm. I listened to some sermons from a guy named Erwin McManus. He's a pastor in LA. My friend gave me these CDs. I was really struggling at the time. 
I was having a lot of anxiety and fear. Things were coming back on the surface. And I just could never get, a, get rid of it. And then I listened to these sermons and it just spoke to me for the first time. Jesus spoke to me in a way that I connected with it. And so I remember praying, God, if there is something to this Jesus, I'm open, show me the signs. And sure enough, I started seeing the signs everywhere. But then I met a Buddhist energy healer who really is the one who explained it to me that really helped me understand what, what Jesus did. Hard to explain. It's, it's a long story. But mm. from that experience with the Buddhist energy healer, I said, all right, I'm going to give this Jesus a shot. And my faith started to grow from there. I started to transform from the inside out. Mm. And then I wrote the energy bus shortly after that. So it just was something where I just had this more intimate connection with God and God started to reveal things to me. I started to get these ideas and insights that were coming to me and then started writing that book. And I wrote it in three and a half weeks and have written over 20 books since, right? So all that, all take about three and a half to four weeks to write. It's really incredible. I get the idea, I have the vision and I start writing it and the story just, to, just unfolds. It's like, I'm writing, I'm not the author, I'm just the pen and I'm just writing these stories down. So I give all credit to mm -hmm. God in that way. But, but I'm someone who, um, you know, again, who went from negative to positive, like George and the energy bus and work with tons of companies, tons of sports teams, NHL, NBA, major league baseball, NFL. So I work with a lot of great companies, fortune 500 companies, a lot of great sports teams, a lot of schools. And so when I'm, you know, speaking to all these organizations, I don't bring my faith into it. I, Mm -hmm. share principles for leadership principles to be your best but my faith drives me in all that i do it's amazing I, I felt like i had a similar experience where i came to faith you know in my 30s too and and um it's interesting i i'm really going through a part where i'm trying to align my work with with my newfound faith is, is that something that you you wrestled with i mean i really wrestle with it my my faith just sort of guided my work when i first um received jesus and said okay i'm gonna i'm gonna believe and it wasn't even like i had a choice it just i mean i'm meditating and seeing a glowing cross so it was almost like it just started to speak to me mm -hmm. and then I, I transformed from the inside out like who i am now is so different than who i was mm -hmm. so my life testifies that something happened even if you're not a believer you know in this your life testifies to who you are and people notice the change so many did who mm -hmm. knew me before and my wife knew me so for me, I reached out to the pastor whose sermons that I heard and we started talking. I said, maybe I should go into the ministry. And he said, no, no, do not go into the ministry. You are right where you're supposed to be. Go work in the world, go impact the world the way you're supposed to. And so I just did that. So for me, I did what I was born to do. I'm doing what I'm born to do. And my faith is just, is driving me. It encourages me. Like your faith in God doesn't make your life easier it makes you stronger and mm. so through all of this i had more strength to go after things more confidence to pursue things i no longer felt fear i have peace right now even through all this coronavirus i mean mm. i don't have this angst i did when i lost my job during the dot-com crash mm. years ago when i wasn't a believer and i i didn't handle it well i did not pass that test but it prepared me for a moment like this, because that's where I found my faith. Those were the moments where my wife almost left me and losing my job and all that fear. It prepared me to be someone who could take on the challenge now to be a light for others. So in doing that, you know, and going through that, I became who I was meant to be. So I would say, yes, you know, it's just one and the same, like your work and worship, you know, because work comes from the word worship and like they should be one and the same. Like you're not supposed to separate your spiritual life from your work life. I think many people do. And what happens is they're so burned out at work. That's why most people are disengaged to work. The research shows most people hate their jobs. Mm. And so the key is how can I use my work as a way to make a difference? How can I use my work to make an impact in others? How can I be missional about my work? You don't have to go on a mission trip to be on a mission. Every day you can bring your mission to the work that you do.
Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying the conversation so far. I just wanted to let you know on the 24th of October, I will be welcoming 12 men to the Always Better Than Yesterday Good Fathers program. It is six weeks of online journeying with 12 good men. I really believe that if I can help good men become even better men, then better men will make better dads. It's been 10 years since I became a father and it has been the most fulfilling journey but full of challenges and obstacles that I probably was under-equipped for. I didn't feel prepared for the sacrifice, the tiredness, the impact on our health, let alone what it means to be a good husband and a good teammate um, as we try and journey in becoming the best dad possible. These children don't come with guides and it just for me I I felt like I whilst I wanted to be the best dad I could possibly be I definitely felt a sense of winging it and it doesn't seem to be conversations that men seem to have uh, about what it means to be a dad so I've set up Good Fathers is the first program that I'm offering dedicated specifically to men good men who want to become even better dads come and join us we're starting on the 24th of october use the link in the show notes to come and read more about it but first and foremost this will be a safe space for men to explore their purpose as a father it's going to contain a combination of coaching learning conversation and reflection. Each week we'll follow a semi-structured topic of conversation. I'll support you with resources and prompts designed to facilitate a powerful transformative experience. You will not only learn from me but from each other and shared experiences. I do not have all the answers but I will hope to create an environment and a space for you and and, and other good men to reflect and to create much more of an intentional style of parenting that will help you leave that legacy by becoming the best possible dad that you can be. If you know a good man that would benefit from this container, this time and space, please do share them the show notes. It's www.abty.co.uk forward slash good hyphen fathers. That's good fathers on our website. Here we go back to the conversation. I love that in um, in Irwin's recent book, The Way of the Warrior, and it, there's something within that that connects with something I think you said in the training camp, which is about your gifts are not yours; they're for those that need it in the world. How did you realize what your gifts were? I think you just realize what your gifts are by by doing them and by mm-hmm. living them and seeing how people respond to you. Because I didn't know what my gifts were, still discovering my gifts as we move along, but I never knew I could write fables. But once I started writing the energy bus, my first fable, I'm like, okay, like this is a pretty good story. My wife thought it's okay. <laughs> like she didn't think it was like, <laughs> she didn't think it was amazing or anything. She read it like she never thought it would sell 2 million copies like it has. Yeah. I don't know, I expected it to sell 2 million copies, but there's something magical about it because it's beyond me. Again, I can't take credit. There's something spiritual about this book where the energy just leaps off the page and reaches people and touches people in a way that changes their life. I get so many emails from people that are impacted by it. It's the best feeling in the world. So I guess Mm -hmm. I realized my gift by people responding to me in that way. I would get up and speak on a stage and I didn't think I was very good, but people said, oh, what you said touched me. You impacted me. Okay, well, I guess maybe I'm, I'm good at that. I still need to work on that. I got to get better at it, and I keep continue to get better. Sorry, when I was around 32, you know, 33, and now I'm 49, I still feel like I got a lot of room to grow. So I'm, I'm excited about getting even better. So, so for me, it's about just recognizing that it's writing, it's speaking, it's communicating, it's connecting. My greatest gift is probably taking real complex subjects and bringing them and breaking them down in a simple way that is Mm -hmm. digestible, that people can read, understand, and most importantly, act on. And I Mm -hmm. never knew I had that gift, but I know that that's what I do well. 
I love that. You said something earlier about um, transforming from the inside out. And, and when Martin in training camp gets his injury, it's, he, you talked about him, him having to slow down and having to refocus on what he wants and get his head right. There, that's a little bit like now here in the UK, we're on lockdown. We're having to slow down. And it's, it's a very good parallel to where Martin found him. How do you start that transformation from the inside out? Well, first you recognize the power is on the inside. So it comes from the inside and we create inside out. So knowing that it would make you want to work on the inside. It's knowing that we can't control a lot of things on the outside. I'm in lockdown as well. I'm in an area where it's not as bad as the other parts of the country, but you know, we're still expected to be in our homes and isolating and so forth and, and not going out as much. We're about to change that, which is, which is I think is good. But for the most part, you know, it's recognizing that you have to find peace within you to create mm -hmm. peace on the outside of you. So it starts within. Everything starts within. And if you, my good friend, Ar Erwin McManus, you know, who led me to Jesus, he says, you know, the world will never know peace unless we know peace within. And so it starts with us. The, manif the world is a manifestation of, of us. It's like the coffee bean analogy that I share, right? You could mm -hmm. be a carrot, egg, and coffee bean. You put the carrot into hot water, it gets weakened by its environment. You put the egg into hot water, it gets hardened by its environment. So often we allow the environment to affect us. We're like the carrot mm -hmm. and like the egg, bitter and angry or weakened, anxious, fearful, like the carrot. Or it could be like the coffee bean, which you put that coffee bean into boiling hot water. And what happens is it transforms the water into coffee. We don't even call it water anymore. We give it a new name. We call it coffee. And so that's our job, to transform every environment we're in, to transform from the inside out. So for me, it's prayer. It's mm -hmm. meditation. It's trust. It's positive talk to yourself, encouraging talk. Instead of listening to the negative thoughts, speak words of encouragement to yourself. It's knowing those negative thoughts are not coming from you because you would never choose to have a negative thought. I ask people all the time, do your negative thoughts come from you? And they say, yes. I said, really? Who would ever choose to have a negative thought? This blows people's mind. Because mm. they're like, yeah, I wouldn't. And then I say, do you choose your thoughts when you're dreaming or having a nightmare? No, those thoughts are just coming in. So it makes them think. No one has ever found a thought inside of a brain. The brain is the hardware. The mind consciousness is the software. And so we're always downloading thoughts, but you don't have to believe those negative thoughts. You got to speak truth to those thoughts. So to me, it's understanding how the battle is going on. There's a battle going on versus good versus evil. There are negative thoughts. There are fearful thoughts. There are thoughts that want to sabotage you. They want to distract you. They want to distort truth with lies. They want to mm -hmm. discourage you. They want to make sure they create doubt within you and they want to divide you. They want to separate you from your friends, from yourself. The word anxious means divided. They also want to mm. separate you from God, ultimately. That's the goal. Mm. The garden is a great metaphor for that. I just wrote a book called The Garden, and it's a great metaphor because the garden represents man's separation from God when Adam and Eve ate the fruit because they didn't trust in God. They didn't rely on God. They believed the lie that they weren't like God because the enemy said, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. They already were mm -hmm. like God. In Genesis, it says, Genesis, it says they were made in the likeness and image of God. So they already were. They believed they lied, the lie they weren't. They ate the fruit. And what happened was they were now separated from man, from God, man from God. And that's what we do every time we believe the lie. We're being separated. And what mm -hmm. we have to do is make sure that we bring truth to those lies. We have to trust instead of doubt. We have to encourage instead of discourage. We have mm -hmm. to focus on what matters most instead of being distracted, which is love. And we have to make sure that we are uniting. How do you unite? Well, what happened in the garden, the separation of man from God gets reconciled on the cross. Jesus mm -hmm. came to unite man back to God. Like the two stories fit so perfectly together, thousands of years apart, two perfectly together. One is from the Old Testament. One is from the New Testament. Two, in essence, different religions, and yet the two stories fit together so well that you have to say there's something there. Mm. And when you understand there's evil in the world, because there is, you can look around and you can see it, you know that this is the answer 
to the evil. We mm -hmm. fight evil with good, with love. Love conquers fear. Yeah. Love conquers hate. You have a lead with love. Love wins. And so okay. this really, it's a love story. It's a beautiful love story that we just need to understand. It's not a religious story. It's not a control story. It's not someone who wants to take away your right to make you a, a holier than now person. It's about knowing that you are loved and you are meant to be loved and there is no judgment associated with the life that you live. It's about knowing that God loves you and it's about becoming all that you are created to be in God's image. I love that. I, uh, I definitely had a moment before this, this uh, podcast interview. There were moments where it was, oh, this is too good to be true. I had those moments of fear, these moments of doubt. Why would John Gordon be coming on my show? All these thoughts were coming in and I knew enough about them and myself that I just had to leave it at the hands of God and just trust. And I had a moment of prayer. The family came around me and just, yeah, it was, it was, it was a beautiful little moment really. And it speaks volumes to what you've just said within, um, Within the energy bus, I a I love the voiceover, and I, I would love to hear your um, your your Joy's voice very soon. But um, <laughs> she says it's all about heart, Georgie. I hope you're ready. Once you take the next step on your journey, there ain't no going back. Lead with all your heart. Why is there no going back? Because once you understand how the world works, when you understand that it's love instead of fear and you understand this truth, there is no going back to the lie. Once you have been to the light, you're not gonna go back into the darkness. So you've seen the light, you're gonna to continue to move forward in that light, in that love, because you recognize that that's where the power is. So there is, there is no turning back. It's about creating a brighter and better future. It's about the vision to move forward, the purpose that drives us there. So for me, there's no turning back and it's, Funny to hear those words because I wrote those words in 2006, right? Think about that. Mm. 2006. It's now 2020. That's 14 years later. The book came out in 2007. Mm. But guess what? It hit the Wall Street Journal bestseller list last week, 14 years later or 13 years later. Crazy. It's, um, it's always supposed to be there. It's so, so good. Um, and, you know, your legacy is is beyond just the the energy bus because i sit here with the energy bus for kids and you know i i've i, I have a, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and, and you know we we read this we read this a lot um and and you know my son has taken this into his primary school he he's shared the lessons with his friends there's a picture of it up on the wall like because you know because his artwork um and, and it's really powerful how much do you think about legacy and the next generation I mean, my legacy is real simple for me. It's wanting to just make an impact to encourage and inspire as many people as possible, one person at a time. And mm. it's people at all levels. So I want to reach the 80 year old, the corporate executive, the mom, the teenager, the student athlete, which I get to speak to a lot of. And to reach young people is great as well. I love, I love the fact that I've written four children's books and that kids read them and schools use them. So for me, yeah, it's, it's really exciting to know that these little kids are benefiting from these lessons and, and learning these lessons. But my, my legacy is simple. Like I have this vision that one day when I'm gone and I'm not here, God willing, my kids will, will be around and someone will go up to my kids and they'll meet them and they'll say, uh, your dad made a difference in my life. I read mm -hmm. his book or I heard mm -hmm. him speak. And this happened. So that's all that I, I do. That's how I live my life every day, just knowing that I'm here to make a difference. And ultimately there are going to be stories that are told later on. Mm. And uh, my brother laughs at me, but I say, I just want a great funeral. <laughs> I want a great <laughs> funeral. I won't be here to enjoy it, but I, I want a great funeral knowing that I made a difference, which shows you like, it's not about your ego because you're going to be gone. You're not like you're enjoying it, but you know, you did the work that you were supposed to do. And then God yeah. says, well done, good and faithful servant. So that's what I hope for. Mm. You you mentioned in training camp, which I know was again some time ago, about being a 50 percenter. Don't be a 50 percenter. What does that mean? Yeah, you give everything that you have every day. Life is too short to be average. And you were not meant to be average. You are here for greatness. You are here to do something great. And you want to be great. Everybody wants to be great. I've never had anyone say, I want to be average. Deep down, we all want to be great. Why? Because we know 
within us, there is greatness. And so we want to fulfill this potential we know that we have deep down. And God put that greatness within you. Because there is no greatness without God, because why would you truly want to be great? It's not like in nature, you know, the elephant says, I want to be great. You know, it's not <laughs> like the, the cheetah says, I want to be great. You know, the rooster says, I want to be great. No, they're just doing what they're supposed to do. The dog doesn't say, I want to be great. Maybe the cat says, I want to be great. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> no one really says they want to be great. You know, but, but for humans, we have this desire to be great because we know that there's an ideal of greatness that we're meant to strive for and meant to push towards. So, so to me, don't be a 50 center percenter. Be a person who pursues excellence, who works on your craft, who pursues greatness. But you got to decide what that is. And you got to understand what that is for you. Like mm. focus on what matters most, but learn and understand what that most is for you because it's going to be mm. different for each person. The thing you don't want to do is spend your life working hard on something that doesn't really matter. Working mm -hmm. hard on something that you really weren't meant to work on in the first place. We're doing something because people expected it of, of you rather than what you felt deep in your heart you were meant to do. Yeah, I love that. I've got a question from an audience member, Naomi. She says, um, do you have days when you feel like you've hit a wall, you just want to stop showing up? And, and do you feel that kind of burden of, you know, being the founder of the positive university, do you find, you know, that a bit of a burden? Of course, there's always a, a, a burden. There's always a day where you don't want to get up, where you don't feel like being very positive. Mm -hmm. And people need to know that I'm not naturally positive. I have to work hard at it because I naturally go towards a negative. But it's on those days where you tap into a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. Your purpose gives you something to be positive about. And we don't get burned out because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. So what is your why? What is it that you truly want to do? And that why will drive your positivity. It will drive your action. So on those days that I, I don't have it, my purpose keeps me going. Just like this. I mean, I've been doing like four Zooms a day. <laughs> and, I, and I know, okay, I'm meeting with Ryan right now. I don't know where Ryan is. I didn't even know you were from overseas. I, you know, again, I've been swamped with so many things. And I'm like, all right, I'm I'm ready. And whoever he is and whoever his audience is, I got to give him my best because mm. this might be the first time they're ever hearing me. And this might be something that I, I might say something that can impact them. And if I don't do this, if I don't give my best then maybe I don't impact them and I don't make a difference. So for me, there is no other way. You're like you have to give your best. Wow. I love that. And um, my ethos is about helping people be always better than yesterday. And I'm just curious to know what that phrase means to you. So helping people be better than yesterday. Well, the goal in life is to live young, have fun, and arrive at your destination as great as possible. As as no, as as uh, yeah, as great as possible, is it? <laughs> yes. And with a smile on your face. No, as late as possible. That's what it is. It's been a long day, Ryan. It's been as late as possible and great with a smile on your face, knowing that you truly enjoy the ride, but also it's to get better every day, to be better than you were yesterday. And so you wanna make sure that you wake up and you are striving to get better today than you were yesterday. Don't settle for average. Don't look into the past, look into the future. How can you improve? How can you grow? How can you get better? So don't compare yourself against other people either. Like don't try to be better than someone else. Mm. Just be better than you were yesterday. I love that. I'm sure you get asked this all the time about having written 20 books or which one's your favorite, you know, where shall I start? But which one would, are you recommending to people most during these times? The energy bus is just probably why it's selling like crazy right now because people are looking for positivity, but the carpenter is mm. probably my best book. People say it's my best book. Um, it does the best in Germany. Actually, I found out <laughs> than all my other books. So The Carpenter, um, <clears throat> and then I, I would just say, you know, if you're a leader, the power of positive leadership and how to lead your team during this challenging time, to build the culture, to continue to infuse them with positivity, to develop relationships, to make sure you're having the difficult conversations and you're not ignoring the reality and you're discussing the facts and you're sharing the truth and even if it's bad news, right? So. So I think power, positive leadership, the carpenter, 
and the energy bus. But my favorite book is Training Camp. So my favorite that I've mm-hmm. written is definitely Training Camp, the winning habits that separate the best from the rest. Yeah, I love that. And um, my particular favorite lesson is the best make everyone better. I, I absolutely love that. And you know, and I, and I sit here, you've acknowledged my t-shirt, Lead With Love. You know, I come from a policing background, one where we, we typically think leadership is about rank and hierarchy and, and we're tough. And you gave me the, cur- the courage and the confidence, or you drew that out of me to talk about leading with love. I already knew it was important. I already knew that love was something that was really important um, to me. And, and you helped me not only lead with love, but to love tough. I love this sense that you talk about love tough. What does that I won't keep you too long, but just what does love tough really mean? Yeah, I love that too. My dad was a New York City police officer. So my dad was a a loving man, but he was very tough. But Mm. the key to leading people is to love them first. If they know you love them, you earn the right to challenge them. This is not about love being soft or weak. Love is strong. People run into burning buildings to save other people because of sacrificial love, right? That's why they do it. When you're fighting in a war, yeah, you're fighting for your country, but it's also for the person to your right of you and to the person to your left of you. It's the bond, the love you have for your brothers that cause you to fight for them. So, so love is tough. Love makes you strong. So for me, love tough means I'm going to love you. And then in loving you, I earn the right to challenge you, to push you to be great because I'm not going to let you settle for anything less than your best. So as a leader, this is key. If you want to be a great leader, you got to have love and accountability together. Too much love, not enough accountability. You're not building greatness. Too much accountability, not enough love. You're driving them all the time, but they're going to burn out. And they're not going to trust you. And you're not going to have a great relationship with them. And they'll probably eventually have disloyalty towards you and, and leave and go somewhere else. Bring the two together, love and accountability. You now have love and accountability. This is what I expect from you. And this is what you can expect from me. These are our standards. This is our culture. This is what we value. These are our principles. This is what we stand for. And you have to live up to that. And if you don't, this might not be the right place for you. So that's love and accountability together. But thanks for saying that. And I appreciate that you do it. Again, doesn't mean we're weak. People think it's weak. I always say, don't mistake my kindness and my love for weakness. Because mm-hmm. if you come at me, I'm going to have to knock you out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And open, up a you... can of po- and open up a can of positive energy on you. <laughs> I love that. You know, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm very loving, but uh, but I also believe that no, I do believe again. Growing up with a dad was like that. Like he made he made me into a tough person, and mm-hmm. so I know I'm tough. But I think men in general are pretty tough. We just mm-hmm. need to learn how to share love more. Mm. Do you have a joy voiceover for me? God, if I can remember, I recorded that again in 2007, <laughs> but. Uh, Hey, George. Uh, no. Hey, Sugar. Hey, Sugar. Yeah, that's it. That's the uh, one. Yeah. Hey, Sugar. Amazing. Amazing. I love it so much. Um, thank you so much for your time, not just now, but everything that you've you've done to support myself and my Always Better Than Yesterday community up until now. Um, would you do me the honor and the privilege of leaving us with a, a final thought from your good self? Ryan, my final thought was that you're awesome. You have great energy. I can see you having a great future in this work that you're doing. Appreciate your family supporting you in this and, you know, supporting you. I interviewed Matthew McConaughey the other day. He's the famous actor. Mm -hmm. And I felt as I was interviewing him, maybe the way you felt about me, like I was going into this interview with Matthew, like, how did I get Matthew McConaughey on my podcast? Like I was, I was a little nervous. The fact that he was Mm -hmm. doing it turned out great. And you find that good people attract good people. So my my final thought is that being positive doesn't just make you better. It makes everyone around you better. And the more positivity we are, the more positive we are, we attract more positive people to us. And right now in adversity, remember this, stars shine the most through adversity. I mean, stars, sorry. Stars shine the greatest in the darkness. That's it. Mm -hmm. And positive people shine the most through adversity. That's what it is. And so, and then this is not about being positive and seeing the world through rose colored glasses. This is knowing that the reality of the the situation is is challenging, but you have the power to overcome the thorns that exist from those roses. And so we're going to take this bad, turn it to good and create something great. So 
sorry for those little few mess ups there. I'm like, wow, I'm, I gotta I probably need to cut back on some zooms, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and your service. Really appreciate it. Hey, Ryan, appreciate you and all the work that you do. Keep up the great work. Thank you for making it to the end of the interview here on YouTube. I hope that our time spent together has left you a little bit better than before you push play. Before you go anywhere, please leave a comment down below. Some of your key reflections, your key takeaways. I love hearing from you and what this conversation has inspired in you. Let me know what you're going to do as a result of this conversation. I will be back next Wednesday where I will share another inspiring guest. To make sure that you don't miss that, please do subscribe hit the bell and you will be notified as soon as it goes live. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organisation, please do visit alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com and it will be my honour and privilege to help you in any way I can. Keep leading, my friends. I've been Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast here on YouTube. Always love.